This FedGov Today program is sponsored by the National Contract Management Association and the Contract Management Institute. On this edition of FedGov Today with Francis Rose, the plan to hire and keep the next generation at the Commerce Department and a change at the top at the Federal Acquisition Service. Welcome to FedGov Today with Francis Rose. The Commerce Department workforce's Generation Z population is only about 1.6%. The Pew Research Center defines Gen Zers as 26 years old or younger. Jessica Palatka is the Chief Human Capital Officer at the Commerce Department. Jessica, welcome. It's great to see you. You may mentioned that number on a podcast earlier this year. What's the current state composition-wise, workforce-wise, skill set-wise of the workforce at the Commerce Department? Well, so the Department of Commerce has approximately 47,000 employees, uh, all 50 states, about 86 countries, so quite a depth and breadth. Um, our mission critical occupation series also expands just as widely as, as those numbers. So we see quite a few different um, genres of employees across the globe. Um, when we look at our workforce, what we're seeing is that while you mentioned the, the smaller percent in Gen Z, we're also very heavily focused on um, every other aspect of the organization, looking at a retirement population, what we potentially could lose, to then turn over to bring in some new, exciting talent that's maybe different skill sets to meet some of the demands that we have now in, in our environment today. So we have about 19% of our workforce currently that's eligible for retirement. In the next five years, that creeps up to about 20 25%. If we look across federal government, the federal government is looking at about a 30% in the next five years. So while we're slightly below, we're pretty much on target to mm -hmm. have that type of turnover that the rest of the government is seeing. Mm -hmm. What happened, or maybe it's coming, to the retirement wave that we've been talking about for about 25 years? Because the numbers that you just laid out there, both for the federal government and for the department in particular, mm -hmm. are worth noting, but mm -hmm. they don't strike me, it doesn't sound like something that we should really get really terribly worked up about. No, I would agree with you. Um, I, we are not, we are also, you know, we monitor, we watch, we also look at the um, historical trends of retirement um, applications that we receive to see if there's an increase, but we have not seen that. Um, what you're talking about, what we've heard referred to as the bathtub yeah, effect. that's right. Um, this really never happened. We never saw that. I think part of what stopped that bathtub from draining was partly in due to the pandemic. I think that put a lot of plans on hold, just the uncertainty in general. Um, not knowing what was to come, not knowing what the future looked like financially um, or from a work perspective, left a lot of people staying where they were in their positions. Um, and holding on to what they could in a time of such uncertainty. You've talked in the past about how your office and your team is uh, focused on strategic issues as much or more than tactical issues regarding human capital. Um, what opportunity do you have as you talk about the, the changes in the workforce that you did at the beginning of this conversation? What opportunity do you have to think about how you want to reshape it about uh, classifications that you maybe don't need anymore mm -hmm. or that you don't have now that you need to create for new things that the department's doing or new technology opportunities and so on. Yeah, absolutely. The What's interesting is the impact that legislation is currently having on the skill sets that we require, especially at the Department of Commerce, where our work is so varied. And when we're looking to attract that Gen Z population, the best thing that we can do to retain, to recruit, to attract is to communicate is to really share the, the amount of capabilities that are available at our department because often it's not known. You have an organization like NOAA where you have the hurricane hunters, the flashy things, the National Weather Service, fisheries, wind energy, things like that that people don't really associate with commerce. Um, and then you have things like artificial intelligence where we're seeing quite a few of our 13 bureaus that are participating in the uh, president's newest executive orders to look at risks and safety of artificial intelligence and how we're going to really ensure that we are still innovative while being safe with our, our you know, citizens' data. Um, you, know, you, you start to look at broadband infrastructure. You look at the CHIPS Act for America and you see all this flashy work. And when you talk about how are you going to attract, how are you going to change skill sets, how are you going to reclassify PDs, you really have to look at every position individually, see what it needs, see what's new, see what we can replicate. Um, but at every point in time, we also have to look at the candidate pool to make sure that not only 
are we trying to classify the work but ensure that the population is available to support those needs? Mm -hmm. And where it's not, encourage things like minority serving institutions, underrepresented areas, veterans, um, military spouses to get training, to upskill, reskill, to really get them in those new technologically advanced positions um, and in other areas to support what we're getting from Congress and from the president. You get at the other side of what the challenge is for I think all of your colleagues across government and that is it's terrific to do whatever you do on your side for job announcements and classifications and so on if the people to apply you can only hire who applies right. and so I wonder what you're seeing on the other side of that equation as far as the people who are looking to come to work for the federal government and how that compares to say during the pandemic before the pandemic and not just related to the pandemic itself but just from a timeline perspective right now is an interesting time for that and the reason I say that is that in the news quite frequently in the past couple months we've heard about you know funding lapses that have potentially occurred we have another deadline that's on the horizon in a two-part series now and then we get asked well, why does it take so long to recruit or how is it so hard to retain in federal government? Well, it's really hard to recruit when individuals, you know, have a countdown clock on their TV that says that, hey, the government might run out of funding. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the kinds of things that are really the more challenging aspects. The individuals see our missions. We communicate that clearly. They see the need for public service and they're interested and they're dedicated to careers in public service. And those are the people that are the easiest to attract because they see the greater good that they're offering to the to their communities, supply chain resilience. I can name all those things I just named with, you know, NTIA and NIST and BIS, but unless that there is that supply chain resilience in place to actually make sure that chips get across, broadband gets put into the infrastructure is implemented, it's just not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So we need the individuals who can see that longer term perspective, who can see the mission of our organization, see the public service that's available to them, and really feel that devotion to their country. What are the skill sets that you need the most right now, Jessica? Oh, I wish I could be unique in, in, in that <laughs> answer, but I'm gonna say the same thing that everyone else is going to say. Um, and you know, this is in, in line with what OPM is putting out, but we're seeing an increase in artificial intelligence needs, and that can mean so many different things from a programming perspective, from a risk perspective from a safety perspective so we need privacy individuals so really running quite a spectrum there Cybersecurity is another one where we are really looking for you know a lot of more IT folks in that area um, supply chain resilience so looking for a lot of sustainment logistics that type of work as well um, and what we're seeing interestingly is a lot of colleges and universities who have dedicated programs now specific to supply chain where that wasn't maybe in the past couple decades a, a thing. Mm -hmm. We just have a couple of minutes left. Suzette Kent, the CIO of the United States during the Trump administration started a couple upskilling initiatives and this administration, the Biden administration has continued them. What does that look like at, at the Commerce Department to try to develop folks for those kinds of jobs who already work for the department who already buy into the mission but might need new skills in order to move into some of those jobs. The Department of Commerce has really taken a focused effort on our learning and development plan. We hired a chief learning officer who is putting into place a learning and development strategic plan that's going to be out looking for about four years in support of our human capital strategy. So just starting off there, we're already you know putting the structure in place. We have what we would call a federated learning and, and development program. So similar to what a, a federated program would be elsewhere, it's based off supply chain. Um, we have a catalog of about 30,000 course offerings that we offer to our entirety of our, our uh, employees. Anyone can participate in any of these courses. Um, what we do, a lot of the times we look at the work itself as the need, but we also have to couple that with the individual and what their skill sets are. So while the input often is mistaken as just the workload planning, we have to look at the workforce planning as well and have a dual load into that you know, human capital pipeline. So looking at succession planning from a very intentional perspective, um, and I'm very fortunate to have a very successful lead in succession planning within my department, and we just held the second cross-government succession planning summit um, to help other agencies as they plan for their own. So looking at cataloging skills, cataloging talent, looking for opportunities of individuals with um, individual development plans to see where they want to go and how we can get them there and then getting the resources available to us, which is often hard in a human capital arena, um, to be able to really help our employees get to where they want to be. Jessica, it's great to have you on the program. Thanks very much. Yeah, great to be here. You can read more about hiring initiatives at Commerce on today's show page at fedgovtoday.com. Up next, a change at the top at the Federal Acquisition Service. FedGov Today with Francis Rose continues in a moment.
If you want insights from agency and industry leaders on the latest topics in technology, management, workforce, defense, and acquisition, sign up for the FedGov Today podcast with me, Francis Rose. I release new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday, so you'll stay up to date on the issues that matter most to federal government leaders. Listen at FedGovToday.com and everywhere you get your shows. Don't miss out on the conversation. Follow the podcast today. Welcome back. The Federal Acquisition Service at the General Services Administration will get new leadership in the new year. Sonny Hashmi's last day at the top of FAST will be December 29th. Tom Howder, the Deputy Commissioner, will be Acting Commissioner. Soraya Correa is Executive Director of the Contract Management Institute at the National Contract Management Association. She's former Chief Procurement Officer at the Department of Homeland Security. Soraya, welcome. It's great to see you. One of the tenants, I think, of Sonny's tenure as the FAST Commissioner was innovation. He tried to bring the innovation mindset from his CIO tenure at GSA, same as you, uh, establishing the Procurement Innovation Lab at the Department of Homeland Security. What do you see on the landscape now, whether at GSA or elsewhere in government, innovation-wise regarding acquisition? Well, Francis, thank you for having me. I'm very excited about what I see. I see a lot of agencies adopting innovation labs or innovation hubs to bring about needed change, needed reform, but focusing on the solutions that will impact the mission. So I'm very excited, whether you talk about Treasury, HHS, uh, State Department, et cetera, and of course DHS continues its great work in the area of innovation. So I'm very excited. I'm glad that Sonny brought that forth to GSA, and I look forward to other agencies doing the same. What are the common threads among those places that you've seen this be successful? What drives the fact that it works or how can you tell maybe this isn't going in the right direction? Leadership commitment. Mm. The leadership at the top has to be committed to accepting innovation and accepting that with innovation, with trying new things, there's a potential for failure. So when I see that leadership commitment, I think they're going to be successful even when they have a few minor failures along the way. One of the examples of that, I think, was, was in your tenure DHS. You were on the t television show I did previously yeah. to basically say, yeah, we messed up. Yeah. And to talk about that very openly, very rare in government. Why is that so rare and what can leaders do to make that less rare? Yeah, so it's rare in government because nobody wants to admit a failure because there's gonna be oversight and there are gonna be folks that are gonna question why you did what you did and why did you fail. Um, what makes that so unique though, when leaders do that, it instills confidence in the staff. It says, we're gonna have your back and we're gonna recognize that sometimes in trying to do something different, we might not get it right the first time. We're still gonna give you credit for trying. Mm -hmm. And that's what people want. People wanna know that they're supported, that their leadership understands what they're trying to do and that they're gonna be given that chance to do something different. There's a lot of discussion about technology, AI in particular, in the acquisition world. Is there a risk of trying to sprinkle some technology onto reform efforts like you've already described and being distracted away from getting to the outcomes that people want? No, I believe that actually AI will support what we're trying to do. I think the advancements in technology that we're seeing, the power, if we can harness the power of that technology, working in partnership with our CIO, our cybersecurity folks, and our contracting professionals, we can actually create more effectiveness in the process. So I'm very excited about what I see with AI, participating in a lot of activities. In fact, NCMA, just recently we entered into a partnership partnership with World CC, one of the other leading uh, contracting organizations out here. And together, we're not only going to advance the contract management standard, but we're going to be looking at initiatives like AI and how we can advance the profession using technology. I know you're also excited about the Contract Management Institute. What are you doing there? And it, it's, come, it's come back. It's something that existed before. Correct. You've reinvigorated it. What's your goal for that? Our goal here is to conduct research studies and analysis that help the practitioner, that help the buyer and the seller come about and bring effective solutions, understand better the profession. One of the things we want to do is advance our contract management standard, which is the common language for our profession. But also we want to make sure that we have all the right certification standards, that we're enhancing our existing certification standards, that we're helping the profession and the professional develop and grow. This is an important 
part of the mission. What we do enables mission. And so we need to get it right. And how we're going to do that is through the studies and analyses, the partnerships, the collaborations that we create. I'm excited by the CMI because it's all about engagement. It's about development. It's about helping this profession. And you know I'm passionate about this profession. And I know people shouldn't get in your way when you get passionate about something. <laughs> Soraya Correa, it's great to see you. Thank it's you. Great to see you as well. Thank you. You can read more about the Contract Management Institute on today's show page at fedgovtoday.com. FedGov Today with Francis Rose continues in a moment. If you want insights from agency and industry leaders on the latest topics in technology, management, workforce, defense, and acquisition, Sign up for the FedGov Today podcast with me, Francis Rose. I release new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday, so you'll stay up to date on the issues that matter most to federal government leaders. Listen at FedGovToday.com and everywhere you get your shows. Don't miss out on the conversation. Follow the podcast today. The leader of the IT operation at the Department of Veterans Affairs is encouraging his team to, quote, embrace the red. He's writing about the vision and implementation for that operation in a series of blog posts about digital transformation. Kurt Del Bene is Assistant Secretary for Information and Technology and Chief Information Officer at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Kurt, welcome. It's great to see you. I quote, this means, you write, that rather than hide issues from the rest of the team, we encourage people to bring them forward so we can solve them together. Why is that important, in your view, for the vision you're trying to deploy at VA? Well, I think one thing, we live in a world of incredible complexity, and it's natural when there's a problem in the system to say, well, it was, it was the system's fault, it was the, another team's fault, and if we're ever going to get great about incrementally getting better in our technical um, prowess, our technical oversight, it requires people to say, hey, in this case, actually, the problem was with me, or was with our systems. Here's how we need to get, a, get better at it. And we also have to actually unleash the problem-solving uh, capabilities of the whole team. So if, if people kind of try to get through the, the, um, the after-action report so f without really kind of digging in, then the problems don't get solved and we don't get better. So we're after kind of continuously getting better and better in our operational rigor. And a key part of that is owning the problem, bringing it forward to the group so we can pro solve it together. You use the word incremental, and that's a theme that runs throughout all 10 of it these is. posts that you've put up so far. Yet, a lot of the issues that VA is up against from a technology perspective are fairly urgent. How do you balance trying to get a lot done in a short period of time, especially as a political appointee, with the idea that the incremental approach has proven to be successful for VA and for other agencies? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, we really, I'm, I've been focusing on how we as a team get better in the work that we do. So as you say, you know, as a political appointee, I only have so much time here. It's about us just improving our ability to define visions for where we want to go, have a connected roadmap for how we get there, have real critical measures of our progress, and then really drive increased operational rigor in every single day. You know, 8 a.m. every morning, I'm with the team. We're diagnosing every single issue that happened in the past 24 hours, figuring out what we're going to do about it, how we're going to get better as a team. And that's where incrementalism really comes in. Mm -hmm. You know, we ask ourselves a lot, did we get a month better every month? Do we incrementally get towards that goal? But as you say, it's also a balance. There's big things we're doing in the VA, and we got to push those forward. But we also got to figure out how do we make our systems, how do we make our processes better every day? Yeah, I was struck by that balance that you're trying to reach there. Yeah. Uh, part four of your series, connect the vision to a two or three year roadmap, but embrace agile development. So you yep. kind of have a foot in both camps, it sounds like. It is. So you got to know where you're going. And in a lot of cases, you know, you go to your stakeholders. A lot of times I think our industry says, well, go to stakeholders and understand what their vision is. And I've told the team, you know, sometimes they don't have a clearly articulated vision, re particularly relative to their IT investments they need. So let's go to them with a straw man and actually say, this is what we think you're looking to do. Here's how we think we could deliver that and then engage with them in the conversation. But the other thing we do is we are very strict now about our prioritization of the work we have to do every day. And so we do a one to end list that says, if we find we have extra dollars because we were cheaper here than we thought we'd be, what's the next thing we would fund in each and every one of the programs? And that has to be in a stacked priority list. Absolute. The first thing we do this, then this, then this. And so that's that balancing act between the long-term vision and the roadmap and what we're doing every day. How different is that roadmap and the culture that it sounds like you're trying to build to what you found when you first got to VA, Kurt? 
Well, I think they've done things like uh, embrace agile development, and that's a big part of it. Instead of going what in the industry has been called waterfall, of have the big long goal and then figure out what are the big milestones you're going to deliver against, the team had already gone to this notion of agile development and scrum teams. Mm -hmm. But I think what needed to be um, done is embrace that in a broader kind of initiative. Again, as I say, what's our vision, what's our roadmap, um, what's our one to end list, how do we do our uh, improve operational rigor over time, and then the other thing, two things we haven't talked about is how do you create a delightful end user experience for, for your end users? You know, we have veterans, millions of veterans, and their experience with the VA increasingly is going to be that digital front door. And they have expectations of what that experience looks like that is defined by their consumer experience. Mm -hmm. So well, how do we create an experience that's just as good? And then the final thing is investing in your people. How do you make it, what's the deal for somebody to come to the VA? How do you make that deal as good as the deal as they get with industry, as well as adding on this ability to serve veterans, which is that sacred you know, trust and that commitment that we all have. Something that you talked about there is something that folks have been talking about in this space for the entire 17 years that I've been here, which is we want to make the digital experience for a citizen the same as that person experiences when they deal with a private sector company. Absolutely. How close do you think you're getting to reaching that point so you can say, well, we're kind of finally now on the same level? Uh, I think we're doing, we're making good strides. Uh, VA.gov some, gets something like 19 million people visited every year. Um, we have gotten a lot of transactions to actually occur, people submitting benefits, submitting um, the, uh, a pro, uh, um, the uh, application process for getting health care, for getting uh, memorial benefits as well. Um, so we get a lot of transaction, that digital transaction happening. The other thing we're doing is we built a mobile experience, a mobile app, and that is the ratings that we're getting for that are incredible. And the millions of veterans that are using, you know, you pull out your phone and that's how you want to interact with VA to, to, and actually connecting to those critical services. At the same time, we've got a lot of those applications that can't yet go through those digital front doors. But we, again, we've got that prioritization. The next thing we want to add to the website is this, followed by this, followed by this. And we've got great UI designers, we've got ba great back end designers, and we're just rolling it out piece by piece by piece. These posts lay out a pretty clear strategic vision. Mm -hmm. How do you convert that to tactical successes using what you called critical measures of progress to get the end result, which is better services for vets? Well, I think the first thing is actually to have those visions in place for, this is an incredibly broad place. There are, it's probably the largest IT shop, in, certainly in the public sector. I mean, if you think of some, DOD is larger, but it is in diff the different armed services kind of sub-segment. We're all one big happy family, so to speak. Um, so it's about having clarity of roadmaps and then incrementally delivering over and over again. And then the other thing we've really focused on is what we call KPI, or key performance metrics that we measure every, we split the, the year in two and we do an iterative cycle every semester that says, as an organization, these are the things we're gonna measure and hold ourselves accountable for. And we do that within the organization overall, and then we bring it down to the portfolio level. And so we are unified as a team towards where we're trying to get to as a result of that. What are some of the big rocks that you're trying to move specifically at the program level right now? Uh, well, there's a, we have some very large programs we're working on, electronic health records transformation, as you and I talked about um, ahead of time. and. Uh, transforming our financial management system with the result of the PACT Act, really kind of automating our digital end-to-end -end in terms of benefits application. Um, we, take the entire place. We have a major transformation going on in every piece of the organization. But then I'm really passionate about how good are we in our operational rigor. So we measure things like the uptime of all of our systems. How do we get to great resiliency in those systems? So even if there is a failure and there's going to be, it kicks over into the backup system automatically with not, without intervention. We also, also measure things like the percentage of incidents caused by change. It's a natural thing in our industry where you change a system and you disrupt that system. If you're not super careful about how you may introduce that change, you're gonna get an error. And so you get better by measuring how often we mess, we mess up something like that. So again, marrying that vision with the execution, with the operational rigor, I think is really the key. If this were the 1950s, the magic word would have been EHR and something would have dropped down mm -hmm. on the set. 
What's yeah. your relationship with the EHR office? Because it's a little different than I think most program offices across the federal government are used to. It is. It's one of the few systems that is brought, has been pulled out into its own organization uh, led by Neil Evans that reports directly to the Deputy Secretary. We are a key part of that in OIT, our Office of Information and Technology, in that the, all the scaffolding that goes into um, supporting the new EHR, the Oracle Cerner EHR, is within our team. We work very collaboratively with them. I am very engaged with that team on a technical basis of understanding where are the risks, um, are we ready? We're, as you know, we're in a pause right now. What are the what are our criteria to restart? How do we feel like we're doing against those? So it's a very deep engagement with that team at the leadership level, and then it's a supporting effort across our entire team. Dr. Evans will be on the program in the next couple of weeks to Great. talk about the EHR program. What's your sense of where not just the EHR program, but some of those other big ones that you talked about uh, stand right now and where they're going? I think they're all. Um, on progress, improving every day. If you look at EHR, as I said, we took a pause. We are getting closer to uh, where we think we need to be to be able to do that re restart. We have a shared uh, deployment uh, called FHCC, or Northern Ch uh, North Chicago implementation, um, where it's a joint site. Both DOD is there along with VA. And that's really going to be a great test where, you know, how do these two organizations merge into a, a consistent set of processes all supported by a single implementation because mm -hmm. the HR is a shared implementation across those two big customers. And so that's what we're really focused on now is making sure that that goes well, but then also constantly reevaluating, making sure the criteria from our stakeholders perspective is met to be able to, to do a restart. The financial, we're also doing a financial management transformation. That's actually going quite well. I feel really good about the modernization plan for um, our core systems in the benefit space as well. Um, another thing we've, we haven't talked much about is on, on the desktop, you know, we have almost 700,000 desktops that we support, and that can even be a digital experience as well. So imagine being able to um, detect whether a particular desktop is having trouble and that person's login time is too, old, too long or the battery isn't working well. Well, we've deployed digital agents so that we can actually figure that out ahead of time. Because imagine the delight if you go to an end user and we said, we noticed your login time is too long. We're actually going to give you a new PC to solve that problem for you. Or how about if we fix that problem before you even notice it as yeah. well? So across the estate, we're, we're figuring out how to modernize the entire experience um, for the benefit of, of our end users and for veterans. Kurt Del Bene, it's great to have you on the program. Thanks it's for pleasure. your time Thanks today. for having me. If you want insights from agency and industry leaders on the latest topics in technology, management, workforce, defense, and acquisition, sign up for the FedGov Today podcast with me, Francis Rose. I release new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday, so you'll stay up to date on the issues that matter most to federal government leaders. Listen at FedGovToday.com and everywhere you get your shows. Don't miss out on the conversation. Follow the podcast today. FedGov Today TV returns next Sunday morning at 1030. I'll see you then. I'm Francis Rose. Thanks very much for watching. Have a great week.